Hi, everyone. Hold on just one minute. We'll start shortly. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our series for Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mike Berger, the Managing Director of Audubon's New York State Program, and I'm speaking to you today from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York, where I'm based. Uh, please mark 4 p.m. on the third Wednesday of every month in your calendars. We have an interesting and informative set of a series of webinars planned for you and I'm, I'm hoping you can join us each month. During the course of this webinar, if you have questions or comments, please type them into the chat box. Our communication staff will be monitoring that and either responding to you directly or asking me to respond at the end of the, of the webinar. We have some time built in for questions and answers after the presentation. So without further ado, let me get started. Across Audubon, we're working under our current strategic plan that runs from 2016 to 2020, and it focuses on coasts, working lands, water, climate, and bird-friendly communities. One of the questions that people keep asking is, how did Audubon decide to focus on those priorities? And that's what today's webinar is about. I'm going to explain how we determine the conservation priorities of the current strategic plan, what the main threats are to priority birds, and how those led to specific conservation strategies and what the focus of those strategies is in New York and Connecticut, which are part of the Atlantic Flyway. In the Atlantic Flyway and in New York and Connecticut specifically, some of these national strategic priorities translate into specific conservation initiatives. For example, the coast strategy is focused on Long Island Sound and the Atlantic coast. The working land strategy is focused on working forests through our Healthy Forest Initiative and the water strategy is focused on the Great Lakes and the Delaware River watershed. In other parts of the country, these strategies are focused on different things. For example, the working land strategy is focused on conservation ranching in the Central Flyway. I won't be covering that today, but there's a breadth of conservation work taking place across the country and the hemisphere. But Audubon wasn't always organized along flyways nor coordinated across the country and hemisphere like it is today. The story about how we came to be organized this way is also the story about how our strategic priorities were identified. A little history here. As recently as 2010, National Audubon consisted mostly of the national headquarters, a national policy office, a national science office, an international alliances program, and a couple dozen semi-independent state and regional programs. And of course, there were always uh, several hundred affiliated local chapters. In 2011, not long after David Yarnold began his tenure as Audubon's 10th president, Audubon initiated a strategic planning process that was built on a comprehensive assessment of all the bird species of North America and their threats, which were organized according to shared habitats and shared geographies. And the themes that emerged from this assessment, assessment led directly to Audubon's being organized by flyways and to the focus on our strategic priorities. So in the first plan, those strategic priorities were coasts, working lands, climate, important bird areas, and bird-friendly communities. But in our current strategic plan, a couple of tweaks were made to those priorities. For example, because it had become clear that nearly all of our conserva conservation work was directed at important bird areas, it was determined that IBAs did not need to be its own strategic priority, and that priority was replaced with the water strategy, which was composed of specific initiatives across the country, such as western rivers, saline lakes, and the Everglades. And at the same time, with the current strategic plan, emphasis was placed on ensuring that all parts of Audubon organization were better integrated in their focus on these strategic priorities, which is an area we've seen a tremendous amount of progress on over the last several years. 
But what did this, prog this process really look like and how did it lead to these strategic priorities? The assessment of all of these priority species was built on the work of many individuals and organizations that have been involved in this type of work, this type of assessment for decades. These include partners in flight for land birds, the U.S. Shorebird Conservation Plan for shorebirds, and the North American Waterbird Conservation Plan for waterbirds. The process was complicated by the fact that these initiatives did not all use the same methodology, criteria, or geography. So we had to sort through the apples and oranges and try to determine the species that we thought were the greatest priorities for Audubon. This actually became easier recently in 2016 when the Avian Conservation Assessment Database was created based largely on the Partners in Flight Species Assessment methodology. Now there is a unified list of priority species for North America. I think you can see by the number of logos how many groups were involved in pulling this together. It's an, a pretty impressive multinational collaboration. Just briefly, I won't get into this too deeply. Uh, this methodology looks at key characteristics of populations to determine their vulnerability level. Population size, distribution, threats, and population trend all factor into determining how vulnerable a species is at the continental scale. And then, to help inform where species should be the focus of conservation efforts, relative density and percent population were used at the regional scale, helping us to know which areas are the most important to each species. What regions, you might ask? Well, we use what are called bird conservation regions, or BCRs. Um, this is the geographic unit that's used for this type of, of, of bird assessment. They have been adopted across Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. It's an interesting sort of side fact that BCRs actually came about as a direct result of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, but I'm not going to get into that story. Uh, that's a story for another day. BCRs are ecologically based units that provide somewhat consistent habitats and support a somewhat unique set of priority birds. The map on the right zooms in to show what the BCRs of New York and Connecticut look like. So what we ended up with is a prioritized list of all of the bird species of North America. We know how vulnerable they are, what their threats are, where they're found, and what the habitats are that they require. I don't expect you to be able to read this, and I don't have time to go through it anyway, but I wanted to show the level of information we had available to us. If you're interested in this level of detail, searching online for Partners in Flight and North American Bird Conservation Initiative reports will help you find it. So at this point, the strategic planning team synthesized all this information to come up with what it thought Audubon's strategic priorities should be. In some cases, this was fairly straightforward because habitat-based species groups naturally aligned along themes. For example, coasts and, and uh, seabirds, uh, coastal birds and seabirds aligned along a coast theme, grasslands and forest birds aligned along a working lands theme, and wetland birds aligned nicely with the water strategy. But in other cases, uh, for example, with the climate and the bird-friendly communities strategies, it was a matter of taking a step back and looking at ubiquitous threats and opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In this graphic, you can also see how some of the habitat suites of birds have relatively higher or lower conservation concern than others, according to the proportions of the species in those groups that are low, moderate, or high concern. Ocean species and tropical su and subtropical forests having much greater proportion of their species as high concern, and then at the bottom, the generalists, which have very relatively few high concern species, but a lot of low concern species. Most, uh, but not all of our priority birds are migratory. This means that they can experience limiting factors and threats in different parts of the hemisphere. To be effective, conservation of migratory birds needs to take into consideration this full life cycle and focus on the limiting factors wherever they occur. The strategies and the tactics we pursue on the ground need to alleviate these limiting factors in order for populations to be able to respond favorably. 
Thankfully, with Audubon's national, international flyway and state programs, along with hundreds of local chapters and dozens of partner organizations from Canada to southern South America, we have the wingspan to address full life cycle needs of these priority birds. Audubon's organization along the flyways further facilitates the collaboration that needs to take place for this. But understanding those limiting factors is not always an easy job. Much of the rest of today's presentation is going to focus on the limiting factors that our priority birds face in the U.S. portion of the Atlantic Flyway, specifically in Connecticut and New York, because those are what drive the conservation work we do every day. Let's start with the coast strategic priority. Here are some of the key birds that our coastal work is focused on, including several beach and island nesting birds, the salt marsh sparrow, and the red knot, which visits only during migration. We focus on the species that are experiencing the greatest population declines and try to address the biggest threats to those birds where we can make a difference. Mostly, this is focused on limiting factors to the breeding birds, and most of our priority coast birds do breed in New York and Connecticut. We can make a big difference stabilizing populations if pairs are able to survive and reproduce while they're here. However, we also have a role to play in addressing limiting factors to these and other birds during migration and during the winter as well. For example, we try to make sure that migrating red knots have ample horseshoe crab eggs on which to forage during migration. And we have also assisted with surveys of piping plovers in the Bahamas to help protect winter habitat for that species. You might be interested to know that the New York and Connecticut region has over 400 breeding pairs of piping plovers. That's approximately 30% of the Atlantic coast population and over 10% of the global population for that species. Clearly, how we treat our piping plovers here can make a big difference to those, popu those bigger populations. As an, as an aside, by the way, I don't know if you're, anyone is following the whole BIRB discussion online, that's B-I-R-B, uh, not a typo. Um, I'll just say piping plovers, both the adults and the young, are clearly burbs. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, look it up. It's a little funny. So to slow or reverse shorebird population declines, four primary threats have been identified to Atlantic flyway shorebirds, and this is what we focus on. Habitat loss and change, human disturbance, hunting, and predation. Hunting of shorebirds is not a thing that happens in the United States, so I've left that off this slide. But the threats to habitat, shorebird habitats have been further refined to address specific um, problems. For example, residential and commercial development, coastal engineering, incompatible management of coastal habitats, and invasive plants and invertebrates. Climate change and associated sea level rise could ultimately be the single largest threat to shorebird populations globally as coastal habitats are submerged or squeezed between rising seas and the built environment. For species like the salt marsh sparrow, sea level rise is undoubtedly the biggest threat. It will be necessary to implement policies and regulations to reduce carbon output and pursue other mitigating factors and also improve the resiliency of both habitats and populations to help these birds deal with the threats from climate change. The key tactics of our coastal work fall into three categories, managing and protecting habitat, reducing human disturbance, and minimizing predation. I'm not gonna go into the details about these though, because this is, will be covered on a future webinar. Here's what some of those tactics look like though, with staff on the beach assessing habitat conditions and birds, outreach to local communities about sharing the shore, and a predator exposure around the nest. As I said, more to come in a future webinar. So switching to the working lands or, or the forest strategy, the forests of the eastern U.S. support approximately 80 forest-dependent bird species that have identi been identified as species of conservation concern for one reason or another. Here are some of the species that Audubon is focused on through our Healthy Forest Initiative. Starting at the top on the left, there's the wood thrush, then the golden wing warbler and the rose-breasted grosbeak, and then the bottom, the black-throated blue warbler, the Canada warbler, the prothonotary warbler, and the prairie warbler. 
Forests in the Northeast have gone through quite a, a long-term cycle. Forest cover in the East declined significantly as land was cleared for agriculture until around 1900, but then as farms have, got, have been abandoned and farmers moved to the Midwest where the soil was better, forests have largely recovered throughout the Northeast. These data are for Massachusetts and Vermont, but the same pattern holds for New York and Connecticut. There are some recent indications that this trend has actually plateaued or even reversed a little due to forest clearing for residential and commercial development, but more northeastern states still have a high level of forest cover. But while our forests were coming back, many forest birds were declining. About one-third of 90 eastern forest bird species have experienced significant population declines in the past 50 years. Several species have lost more than 60% of their populations in that time. This table shows the percent change per year from the Breeding Bird Survey, or BBS, and how that translates into population remaining and population lost over that time period from 1966 to 2013. You can see some very steep declines from some of these species. Sort of leads to this question. What's the problem? Um, it's important to think about how population change actually occurs. Limiting factors that drive population size fall into two broad categories, those related to reproductive success and those related to adult mortality. This was the only dead bird photo our communication staff would let me show you, otherwise it would be too sad. Um, both of these factors are affecting forest bird populations. On the breeding grounds, today's forests tend to be too fragmented still in many areas, uniformly middle-aged, lacking both younger and older age classes, often lacking in diversity of tree species and other plants and vegetative structure, and negatively impacted by deer and invasive species, which also impact vegetative structure. These problems tend to reduce habitat quality for birds, causing low reproductive success, maybe no uh, lack of quality and quantity of habitat, low nest productivity, and low fledgling survival. Adult mortality occurs mainly during migration. It can be caused by predators, collisions with windows and other structures, and, and inclement weather. Some research suggests that the ultimate cause of much of the mortality that occurs during spring migration is driven by inadequate habitat quality and quantity on the wintering grounds and birds that leave on their northward trip in relatively poor conditions. The U.S. Forest Service issued a research review a few years ago that identified the major issues facing forests in the Northeast and made recommendations for how to address those issues. Featured prominently in this report is the recommendation to diversify age classes of forest to increase other measures of diversity, improve wildlife habitat, and increase forest resiliency to climate change and invasive species. This is a part of the core of what drives Audubon's work in the forest, trying to work with forest owners and forest managers to manage in a way that achieves this level of age class and species diversity and provides habitat for priority birds. Deer overabundance is a widespread threat to forest birds and also to forest health. I'm sure everyone has seen a browse line, like is pictured in the upper right photo, where you can see that it looks like the trees have had a straight across haircut. The New York map in the center shows forest regeneration, which is basically the regrowth of seedlings and saplings following a forest disturbance. Green is okay. Orange and red mean that regeneration is not adequate. Um, and then the map of the U.S., the United States, shows deer density. Um, and it, it's, you can see, if you look closely at the New York portion, you can see how the, uh, there's a similarity between the regeneration and the, the deer density maps. Um, anywhere, again, on this U.S. map, shown to be in yellow, orange, or red, basically has too many deer for forests to have good undergrowth and adequate regeneration. That bottom right photo, I put that in there not just to, to prove that every once in a while I get to go out into the field and do something, um, but because it shows a forest impacted by deer. This is an Audubon-owned property, Rhinestrom Forest in the Hudson Valley. 
Um, this is what a browse line looks like from inside the forest. If you just look beyond me in that photograph, you can see there's very little vegetation on the ground or up to about four feet in height. Um, this, is, this is not especially good bird habitat, and this is a widespread issue. Again, I don't want to get too deep into the details of our forest conservation efforts because that is a topic for a future webinar, but our work falls into basically uh, three basic categories, preventing forest fragmentation and loss, managing forests to improve them for birds, and reducing other threats through policy and management. Um, this is what we're doing to help forest birds reproduce successfully and to help halt the declines and build their populations. So switching now to the water strategy, I'm a less familiar with the science behind the water strategy because it originated primarily due to concerns in the western U.S. and in the Everglades where water quality and quantity strongly impact birds and their habitats. However, in our current national strategic plan, additional initiatives have been added that overlap with our work in New York. Uh, not so much Connecticut, so I won't dwell on this strategy too long. But I do want to talk a little bit about the Great Lakes. Um, the Great Lakes compose a globally significant ecosystem. Millions of migratory birds depend on coastal habitats along the Great Lakes for shelter, for rest, for nourishment during their long journeys. Thousands of raptors, waterfowl, and wetland birds rely on the Great Lakes systems for, for breeding. This region has seen tremendous loss of wetland habitats historically, with associated declines in wetland birds and negative impacts on water quality. Audubon's strategy for the Great Lakes focuses on protecting and restoring coastal wetlands. 70% uh, of the remaining Great Lakes wet coastal wetlands are located within the United States, of which 38,000 acres, or 11%, are in New York State along Lake Ontario. In addition to wetland restoration, Audubon is a lead advocate for federal and state funding that supports Great Lakes restoration and water quality improvement. Thriving populations of birds and quality of life for the people of the Great Lakes Basin depend on this type of ecological restoration. Again, look for an upcoming webinar this spring that will talk more about this work and what Audubon is doing for the Great Lakes. During the strategic planning process, it became clear that climate change was an overarching threat that needed to be a strategic priority of its own. There's a long history and a large body of literature documenting the fact that climate change is a threat to birds and other wildlife. Just selecting a couple from the shelf in my office, this first book was published in 1992, and this one in 2002. One of the authors I'll note here on this second book, Terry Root, is a National Audubon board member, um, and formerly, many moons ago, she was my advisor in grad school. And of course, Audubon released its first big report on birds and climate change in 2014, showing how climate is likely to reduce the, uh, the distributions of large numbers of birds. So the upshot of this is there are many different types of studies that show or predict an effect. Some have clear mechanisms like sea level rise or ocean temperature impacts on food sources or changes to migration timing and the floristic and insect cycles. Others are more model-based, like Audubon's climate study from 2014, but all point to significant impacts on birds. And then, of course, Audubon just recently released another big report on how climate change is likely to impact birds, the Survival by Degrees report. This was the topic of last month's webinar, um, I'm not, so I won't go into details. If you missed it and you want to watch it, um, maybe you can type a note in the chat box, and I think someone can, can reply with a link to where you can watch that webinar. But basically, two main takeaways from this new report. The first is the same as from the 2014 report. Climate change is the number one threat to birds, but now we know that the level of urgency has increased. The new report shows that two-thirds of North American birds, 389 out of 604 species that were studied, are expected to undergo range contractions that make them vulnerable to climate change. But there is, there is some good news in the second main takeaway from this new report. If we take action now, we can help improve the chances for 76% of those species by reducing the amount of global warming that takes place. In general, our efforts to address climate change fall into two main categories mitigation, or reducing how much the climate will change, 
and adaptation, which is helping species deal with climate change and its effects. Mitigation essentially boils down to reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere through energy policy reform and other similar approaches. Adaptation involves prote uh, efforts like protecting coastal habitats and facilitating inland migration of salt marshes in the face of sea level rise and increasing forest resiliency so that forests can, can thrive under a new climate. Sometimes uh, mitigation and adaptation strategies are one and the same thing, as is the case when forests are conserved and managed in ways that increase the amount of carbon sequestered sequestr from the atmosphere. And that also supports uh, some of our priority forest birds. Finally, coming to the bird-friendly community strategy. Um, our bird-friendly community strategic, strategic priority began as an engagement strategy in our 2011 planning effort. Basically a way to get people engaged with Audubon's conservation mission starting with where they live. However, with increasing evidence showing the degree of bird mortality that occurs in the vast human-dominated landscape and the development of programs to address those threats, this strategy soon transitioned into a full-fledged conservation strategy. This is part, particularly important to land birds like that wood thrush um, that migrate long distances to get from their temperate forest breeding grounds, uh, pictured top left, to their tropical forest wintering grounds on the bottom left. Often our yards and green spaces and urban and suburban landscapes are the places that they stop over during those long journeys. And they have the potential to play a, a critical role for these migrating songbirds. Although most yards are not large enough to provide suitable nesting habitat for these, this kind of forest-dependent songbird, they can serve uh, as important feeding and resting habitat or stopover habitat during migration. Birds will use any green patch like this to rest and refuel uh, before they can continue with their long journeys. If birds can't find adequate resources to restore their fat reserves during migration, their migratory flights are delayed and they end up arriving on the breeding grounds late or in poor condition, often resulting in reduced reproductive success and survival. Here's a humorous uh, take on, on this function that our yards can, play, uh, can, can uh, fulfill. By transforming our yards, our parks and other green spaces, we can provide important resources for, for migrating birds during the critical phase of their life cycle. And of course, for the more common birds that can nest in, in suburban yards, like orioles and flickers, um, having a bird-friendly yard can help them keep these common birds common as well. It really comes down to improving habitat for these birds in suburban and urban settings. If we improve habitat in urban and suburban landscapes, birds will use that habitat and they will thrive. It all starts with landscaping with native plants to create patches of habitat that provide shelter and food to birds throughout the annual cycle. A native plant is one that occurs naturally in a particular habitat, ecosystem, or region without human introduction. It's well adapted to the region's soils, moisture, and weather conditions, and native plants are crucial to native wildlife. They support native insects, which are the food of our birds. Can you see the two caterpillars in this photo? The birds will. The birds will find them. Native plants cannot, can, can uh, provide shelter and uh, in addition to food. For example, compare these dogwoods, which is a, a, a very useful um, plant that, that we use in, in landscaping. The native dogwood species, flowering dogwood, supports more than 100 species of moths and butterflies more than that non-native um, ornamental dogwood. And it's pretty clear which of these will benefit birds more. Because birds use our parks and backyards and move through our cities during migration, and even more birds will use habitats that we improve with native plants, it's critical to reduce the threats that they experience in those environments. Research suggests that millions of birds are killed annually as a result of collisions with glass windows and buildings, predation by cats, and pesticide exposure. 
and reducing these sources of mortality can reduce the strain on populations that are already under stress from habitat loss on their breeding and wintering grounds. Going forward, Audubon will be pursuing a widespread campaign in communities across the country to promote policies that require the use of native plants in landscaping and that reduce threats from windows, light pollution, and other sources. More information uh, will be provided about this new effort in upcoming webinars. Um, and I will note there was just a significant uh, victory achieved in New York City, thanks in large part to the efforts of the New York City Audubon chapter. So that completes my overview of the science behind Audubon's conservation strategies and the threats that drive our strategies. Um, and I hope you found it informative. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, again, please type those into the chat box. Sharon Bruce, our communications manager, is going to read the questions to me and, uh, and she and other staffers, uh, members will be responding directly to your questions in the chat box. Sharon, do we have any questions? Hi, hi Mike, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, and I also just wanted to add that, of course, you know, just a reminder, we're recording this. Um, it will be available online. Um, and in case any questions come up about particular resources, we can also share those in the chat box or follow up with you after. Um, so. You can email your questions if they don't get answered here to the email addresses shown on screen. Um, so if you do have questions, please type them into the chat box. Uh, Mike, we had one question about wind energy. Uh, the question was, can you discuss the benefit of wind energy to reduce climate change and uh, also talk a little bit about the impact on birds? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, wind energy is uh, clearly a carbon-free source of energy. It will play a significant role in allowing New York and other places to meet their carbon-free energy objectives. Um, no energy source of energy comes without downsides, and wind energy is, is no exception to that. Um, so we have to be careful with where it's located, with how it's operated, and try to do those things um, in ways that minimize the impact to birds and other wildlife and bats. And um, uh, we're involved in, in that in many different situations. We're, we're very involved, our conservation director in New York and our conservation director in Connecticut, Jillian Liner and, and Corey Folsom O'Keefe, are both involved in uh, the offshore wind development issue. Um, and uh, we're also involved periodically in land-based wind farms that come up, um, trying to keep them away from areas with high concentrations of migrants uh, um, and, and other places where the risk to birds is, in our view, going to be too great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, another question came up. A uh, person was struck by the decline of North American avifauna study that said we've lost 30% of birds since 1970, including common bird species. And this person is wondering how that study's findings um, might affect Audubon's priorities, if at all. Well, that's, that's a great question. So um, the, the folks who did that study, some of them are based right here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, are the same folks who have um, been writing those reports and creating that avian um, database that we use to, to create our strategies. So all of those data that went into informing our priorities are the same data that went into that report, basically, or that study. Um, I always, I joke with them, you know, of course, this is nearly impossible to assess, but hey, if we hadn't been doing all the work we've been doing, it would have been 5 billion birds lost. Um, there's no way to, there's no way to determine if that's accurate or not, but the fact of the matter is the data that led to that study are the same data that we use to uh, identify priorities and that drive the work that we're doing. So we, we are trying to address that very loss of, bird, of birds, yes. Yeah. And another question about our uh, water work. Why do we focus strategically on the Delaware River watershed, but not the Hudson River? 
I'm not sure I have a complete answer to that question. Another good question. Um, there's with any of this, there's an assessment of um, what is the uh, potential benefit, the the role that Audubon can play, the political climate, the opportunity. Um, and I I'm I wasn't the one who made that decision, but I as I understand it, it seemed like there was a lot of momentum and um, it, the time was right to to jump into the Delaware River watershed issue and for Audubon to be more involved there. Um, I just don't think that has necessarily happened or it's not as obvious for the Hudson. Clearly the Hudson is an important river uh, in New York and we have three, um, we have several properties and an environmental education center along the Hudson and uh, it's, it's something that Audubon focuses on but it's not, it's not, doesn't rise to the level of a, a flyway strategy I guess I would say. And I'm not sure that we have any other questions, um, but we can give it just a few more seconds in case anyone is thinking. I think that might be it for us, Mike. Uh, sure. If anyone, again, has any follow-up questions, you can always email the two uh, email addresses on screen, and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, and Mike, in the meantime, you want to send us out? <laughs> I'd be happy to, but do you want to put a plug in for the January webinar before we do that? That would be great. And of course, we did just get one more question, which I'm sure you'll love, um, which is, what's the solution for deer overpopulation? Oh boy, I wish I knew the answer. I would be a very wealthy person um, because it's an issue that's growing and growing. Um, probably the solution is going to be one that involves a lot of deer mortality and it's not going to be something that a lot of people are going to want to tolerate. So um, it, it does, it, it's a little bit depressing in that um, it's hard to think that there's a, a widespread solution to that issue that, that has any chance of, of um, moving along. So we do a lot of small scale solutions. Um, unfortunately, it adds a lot of expense to, to property management, but forested properties are increasingly fenced, especially uh, a managed property after a harvest to allow those seedlings and saplings a chance to grow beyond the reach of deer uh, so that that next forest can reestablish itself. Um, there's a lot of that taking place. Um, we've actually done some of that at some of our Audubon properties where we needed to do some habit, some forest uh, rehabilitation management, um, but we wanted to make sure that we would get adequate regeneration. And the results have actually been pretty impressive. Um, I would say the other thing I'm afraid is going to happen eventually is um, a, a heavy-handed sort of um, natural solution to overabundance uh, through some kind of disease or something. And there are, there is some of that going on already. Um, we have largely avoided it in New York, um, but there have been pretty large die-offs in places in the Midwest where deer have become over overabundant. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for that. Some people are um, advocating that we bring back um, what is often referred to as market hunting and allow the sale of venison um, and, and that that may put enough pressure on the populations to, to cause them to decline. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic that that's going to happen. That's a hot potato politically. And um, do we uh, have input on, um, with the DEC on hunting levels, or do we participate in setting those levels in Another great question. Week? Yeah, another great question. I, I can speak to the New York side. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a full knowledge of how this works in Connecticut, but uh, in New York, we have been working with colleagues at the Nature Conservancy and at Cornell and at the um, State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry to um, create a citizen science-based program called AVID, Assessing Vegetation Impacts from Deer, to provide data to DEC, uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, 
that they can bring into the process of setting deer population objectives across the state. Um, there has previously been no, um, no input of, of real data on the health and the regeneration setups of our forests that have gone into that process. And so that's something that's just beginning. I would say there are, there are some growing pains with that. It's, it's not exactly clear how it's going to work, and it's not clear that there are enough participants to generate the data that will be required. But it's definitely progress, and it's something that we've been involved with, and many of our um, Audubon chapters are interested in this issue, and some of them I, I know are participating in AVID. And uh, another follow-up on that, where was the successful forestry generation work done? Ah, that's at uh, the Rhinestrom Forest, the same place where I showed the photo of what a browse line looks like inside the forest. Uh, we were doing, we were collecting baseline data in that photo to help inform our forest management, and we have implemented forest management. In fact, I think there's some being implemented this winter there again. And uh, the first little pilot patch we did where we removed some dead um, white pines that had been planted quite a long time ago. Uh, we wanted to try to get some uh, younger forest and some understory cover back into that landscape. Um, we fenced that and had a tremendously diverse and, and, and robust response of regenerating forest. Um, that property is open to the public. Um, if you go to our website and look under the centers tab, you can find the Rhinestrom uh, forest information and location there. And uh, we can also share a link to a web post about uh, the work being done at Rhinestrom in the chat. Elizabeth will share that briefly. Um, Mike, do you advocate feeding birds year-round in residential settings? Or I guess not you, but Audubon. I'm going to pass on that question. I have not followed that issue closely. Um, and I, I, I don't want to misspeak. I don't know what the latest is. Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll give you this one. <laughs> um, and I don't see any more questions coming through at this point, but last time I said that, people chimed in with 10 more. So I'm going to give it just another couple seconds. We'll see if anyone chimes in. I see that people are using the raise hand uh, option and unfortunately we can't um, have anyone else uh, become unmuted so if you can please type your questions into the chat that is how we can answer them um, or of course you can email us All right, Mike, I think um, we can call it here. It doesn't seem like there are any more questions coming through. Um, but yes, a good reminder for everyone that we are doing this, uh, these webinars on the third Wednesday of every month at 4 p.m. So that means our next webinar will be coming up um, in January on uh, Oh boy, I just dropped the date out of my screen. It is, hold on one second. Do, do, do the 15th. And we will be sending out an RSVP uh, page for that webinar, just as we did with this and the one before. And again, we will be um, publishing the recording of this webinar on YouTube and publishing it to each of those uh, Connecticut and New York pages that Elizabeth shared in the chat earlier today. Um, but we will also email everyone who signed up to attend the webinar today with a link to the recording once we have it. So keep an eye out in your email inbox, um, not probably not immediately, but in the next couple of days, 
from me, that's Sharon at Audubon, uh, with a link to rewatch and share the webinars um, that we have recorded so far. Thank you for everybody for joining us. Have a good day, everyone.